My name's Jane Horgan. I'm here representing our fantastic team at Cheetah Conservation Botswana, which is CCB. And I just wanted to have a disclaimer straight up off the bat. We are Cheetah Conservation Botswana, but if you see photos of leopards or wild dogs, it's not because my predator ID is terrible. It's just because we work in conflict. So we end up working with all of the large carnivores in our area. Now, I have a secret weapon in the fight against human wildlife conflict. It is a very traditional technique, but one that's not often associated with the human wildlife conflict toolkit. Whiskey. <laughs> it's the best session ever. <laughs> Now, granted, for some farmers, tea and biscuits also works quite well, but I personally tend to work with the Africana farmers, and for them, you need something a little stronger than tea, stronger than your beer as well, Graham, I'm sorry. But it's all about building relationships, and we've heard this already, even though it's only day one of the conference. And relationships are so key in having deep relationships, because you not only are uh, meeting these people and learning about them, you build that trust and it's only when you have that trust that you can understand the full depth of that conflict. Maybe they're not telling you exactly how many animals they're killing, maybe they're not telling you what's really going on, but when you build those relationships you start to understand more. And not just the conflicts that are taking place, but what are the true drivers behind those conflicts? Are there human-human conflicts going on behind the scenes that are driving that conflict? And it's all about building those relationships up. Now, I was in Botswana last year at a party with a whiskey, of course, and a classic scenario started to unfold with the farmers that I was there with. And one of the farmers uh, piped up, of course, just when I'm starting to get in my rhythm and starting to relax. He says, ah, oh, Jane. I've got these wild dogs on my farm, they're killing my calves, you must come and take them off or I'm going to shoot them. Classic story that I hear all the time, usually on my weekends. And I was just about to open my mouth to you know, start my spiel, well practiced over about 14 years of doing this stuff, when the farmer standing next to me steals the words straight out of my mouth. And he says, oh, you know, what, you know what I do? I have one breeding season a year, and I synchronize the breeding season so that it, my calves are born at the same time as the kudu, the local antelope, so that when the carnivores are moving around, they eat the antelope instead of the calves. It's worked great for me. I have hardly had any losses since then. I nearly dropped my whiskey. <laughs> And it took me a while to realize why it was such a wonderful moment. And it was because, you know, we can come in as NGOs and harp on about this stuff and, and intervene all the time. But really what we're trying to achieve is exactly that. We want to find solutions that are effective enough, cost efficient, that suit the local context, things that work so well that they gain this, their own momentum within the communities and they spread like wildfire. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And I'm here today to tell you very briefly some of the techniques we use in our holistic approach to conservation to achieve that kind of behavioral change. Now, Botswana has the largest population of cheetahs in the world, and we are strategically located in the Southern African cheetah population, right in the center, so we're really important for the connectivity of that whole big contiguous population of cheetahs. 39% of Botswana's land is protected in some way, and yet still 78% of our cheetahs are found outside of the national parks and reserves. So because of that, obviously, we have a lot of conflict. Now, we focus our attention in the Hunsi district of Botswana, which is that central west district there. And the reason we're there is because that's where there is the highest levels of conflict in the entire country. Now, there's lots of different land uses in this area. There are a lot of different types of farming and a lot of different cultural groups. And we tailor our solutions for each of those specific contexts. But there is one technique that we've been using that works across all of them. And that is livestock guarding dogs, or LGDs. Now, David mentioned them earlier in his talk. Great representation. Livestock guarding dogs are absolutely amazing. In our program, we 
specifically promote the use of the local land race mixed breed dog, which we refer to as the Swana dogs. And these Swana dogs are absolutely fantastic. We were promoting them initially. We now run a training and placement program. And we take unwanted puppies from shelters across the country and from communities. We bring them to our demonstration farm. And our demonstration farm is also a wonderful tool that we use that showcases all of the predator smart farming techniques that we promote that mitigate conflict. And at the demonstration farm, these puppies l go with the goats and sheep and bond with them. And they learn from the adult livestock guarding dogs that we have there at the demo farm. And once they're four, four to six months of age, after they've received all their initial vaccinations, they get sterilized, they then get placed with the farmers that are having conflict. And these dogs are incredibly effective and they elicit smiles like this. This is Naomi Tarumba. She is a single mom with three kids uh, living in Chobokwani and she had massive problems with her goats getting taken by cheetahs and jackals. And her herd got diminished almost to nothing. It was, she usually went out and herded her, her herd, but then when she needed to stay home with her kids, that's when the goats were getting taken. So we gave Naomi two livestock guarding dogs, and you can see how few goats were left there by the time that we gave her those dogs. And it completely changed everything for her. Her herd grew so much after that that she was able to uh, build a house for her and her kids and install electricity in that house with the money that she raised from that farm. So these dogs are absolutely changing lives. And so far we've placed over 200 dogs in this Hunsi area. And the waiting list for these dogs is was very large. We scaled up a couple of years ago and started creating puppy franchises. So this has been a alternative livelihood for some of our model farmers. And we take, we pay them for every livestock guarding dog that they train. And then the dog is still ours as part of our program and is placed. Uh, and that has helped us to scale up hugely. It's also been really important for quarantine purposes. Last year, our entire demonstration farm had to be shut down because of a nationwide parvovirus outbreak. And we lost 20 puppies at our farm, at our demonstration farm, but thankfully the model farms, our puppy franchises, weren't as badly affected. So it's thanks to them we were actually able to still place some livestock guarding dog puppies last year. And I forgot to mention kind of a key point. These dogs, the Swana dogs, so we did, I did my master's research on dogs that had been tra sourced, trained, and placed by the farmers themselves. They reduced livestock losses to zero in about 50% of cases. We then did the same research on the dogs that we trained and placed from our demonstration farm, and they reduced conflict to zero in at least 85% of cases. So we measure it every single year, and it's minimum 85%. Sometimes 95% of those farmers have losses down to zero, which is just fantastic. So in this Hunsi district, lots of different land use types, lots of different farming types, and we tailor our solutions. So I'm just going to give you a quick rapid fire of what is working for us in the different areas. So on the commercial farmlands, these are fenced ranch lands, large fenced ranch lands that are largely dominated by Africana farmers. They are usually South African or European descent, but some of them are third generation Botswana. <laughs> these guys, the main challenge is that they have very high levels of conflict with all species, and they uh, end up killing quite a lot of carnivores because of conflict. We had one farmer kill 22 lions in one month alone. They really respond well to our rapid response units. They like someone to respond really quickly when they have conflict issues and get to the farm. They also love technology. So the camera traps help inform what's going on and where it's going on on their farm, helps them adapt their management. They're much more managed, these farms, than the communal farms in Botswana. We've tried tracking technology in the form of collars on livestock. We are currently trialing uh, tracking ear tags as well for cattle. And the farmers love translocations, but they don't work, at least for us. 
Uh, so we, our research found that 82% of the cheetahs that we translocated were dead within a year. And the conflict on the source farms did not abate three months after the translocation. They were back up to the same levels as prior. So we don't conduct tra translocations anymore. Also whiskey. Don't forget the whiskey. Very important. Um, so on the communal farmlands, this is where the, the landscape is shared and the grazing is shared. Uh, this is areas that are dominated by Bukhalahadi local Batswana farmers, some commercial but mostly subsistence level farmers. In these areas, and you can see in this photo, you know, you have the tragedy of the commons when it comes to grazing. Overgrazing is a huge issue. Conflict is an issue. And with these farmers, the things that they really sp respond well to is farmers, farmer workshops. In these communities, we do residential workshops at our education center, also go out to communities and do mobile workshops. And in these workshops, we talk about all of the predator smart farming techniques, also predator and carcass IDs to try to reduce the gap between the perceived conflict and the actual conflict that's going on. And the demo farm plays a huge role in those farmers' workshops. We also tailor the workshops to issues that are happening at the time. This was a workshop that we did on um, supplement feed for cattle and other livestock that they can feed to their livestock in the dry season, which our research has shown is when the conflict is spiking. And then when you move into the wildlife management areas, it's a completely different story altogether. So the wildlife management areas in Botswana are dual purpose, semi-protected lands that are largely for wildlife, but then have communities dotted through them that are allowed livestock within a 20 kilometer radius of those villages. And so it's a really interesting dynamic. It's dominated largely by the cultural group, the sand, the Kalahari sand bushmen. And farming isn't really a huge priority in the sand communities. They're not really interested in farming. The government tries to give them livestock as poverty alleviation schemes, but it, they're not passionate about it. They would much rather focus on connecting with their traditional culture. And when we looked at these communities, we tried to do some of our previous farming work in these communities, and it just did not work. So we completely had to change tack. And this is when we started our Communities for Conservation program, and we started looking at alternative livelihoods. So for them, it all came from them. What were their priorities? What were their goals? And the community said that they would love to do more ecotourism, more cultural tourism. Um, and also look at wildlife-based economies, like Graham has been talking about, um, to try to increase those benefits from wildlife. Interesting, in, in this area, the Kalahari sand have some amazing plant-based traditional medicines. This is their bestseller. It's effectively Bushman Viagra. And they sell it just on the side of the, the A2 highway there, the Trans-Kalahari Highway. So we're working with these guys not just that product, but all the other products as well, uh, working over the entire value chain to help them, you know, to use their traditional s sustainable harvesting, uh, but also packaging, marketing, finding markets, and ensuring that they're getting value for their product that's not just the value of the product, but also encompasses the, the indigenous knowledge and the millennia of knowledge that is behind those products. So what have we learned after 20 years of, of working in human wildlife conflict in Botswana? Relationships are key. It doesn't matter if you're talking about individual farmers, policy makers, elders within the community. Deep relationships are so important. And in any company or business, you know, holding on to staff is important but it's, and treating staff well is so vital, but when you're talking about conflict work, it's even more important. You can't have a high turnover of staff when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with communities on the ground that might be a bit volatile. You need people that are hanging around for a long period of time. Be strategic. Resources, we all know, are so, so scarce. Make partnerships where you can. We're partnering with some great universities, partnering with other NGOs to help get big grants. Uh, we're currently devising a strategy where we're partnering with environmental consultancies, 
I work part-time with CCB and also part-time with an uh, environmental consultancy in Australia called EcoShore, who are now looking to source funds and resources to help fill gaps on the ground that CCB can't do on their own. And so looking at things like that that can help achieve the mandates that we need to get achieved on the ground. And the great thing we've found is that coexisting is absolutely possible. So our impacts that we've found is that the cheetah populations in Botswana are stable despite crashes worldwide, despite crashes in neighboring countries like Zimbabwe. The uptake of predator smart farming techniques is going up, especially livestock guarding dogs, which is wonderful to see. And we all know that conflict ebbs and flows, but we're seeing a general decline in conflict in our area, which is great. Now, I must say just quickly before I finish up that a lot of these programs have been inspired by you guys that are in this room. And I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be here to share the same air as you. Thank you so much for everything you guys do for coexistence. I know that's a very, very brief overview of what we do at CCB, but I am happy to have a chat. Please come up and talk to me after or for the rest of the conference. We might even be able to sneak in a little whiskey. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, a few quick questions for Jane. Yes. Uh, yeah, so. Sorry, Thanks. Um, Thanks for the talk. Uh, so the reason I'm asking this is not to put you into the spotlight, but because I was researching on the topic of uh, guard animals, and I couldn't myself answer to, to potential weaknesses for the guard dogs. So the first one is, uh, don't you fear that uh, once a farmer has a bond with the dog and the dog might get killed defending the livestock, uh, that killing might itself trigger a retaliatory killing? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, it's interesting with the Swana dogs. Um, you know, David mentioned the Namibian project. There's also projects in South Africa that use the Anatolian Shepherd dogs. And they're a purebred traditional livestock guarding dog breed from Turkey. Uh, there are lots of other livestock guarding dog breeds. But the Anatolians um, have a tendency of being quite aggressive. And there's been a lot of recorded interactions between them and especially leopards and, and stuff like that. The Swana dogs are a much smaller dog. Uh, the average size dog in my study was like 17 kilograms. They're a real, quite a small dog, which is surprising. You'd think you'd kind of need a big, scary dog to be able to do this work. But they're because of that size and they're generally a lot more timid, um, they don't tend to get into physical altercations as much as sort of what we haven't done any specific research looking or tracking these dogs. Um, but from the anecdotal evidence that we get from the farmers, that seems to be what happens. They'll, they will herd the livestock if there's a threat. They will bark and try to scare it away. And usually just that interruption of the hunting sequence, especially if it, like your cheetahs and stuff that rely on stealth, that's enough to deter the carnivore from trying to attack. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I just, I'm just wondering, like, do you think they can be like a potential negative impact of having too many dogs? Yeah, I mean, we all like it's it's kind of a bit of a paradox because we effectively use street dogs, so it's a bit. Confusing, but we uh, all of our dogs have all of the required veterinary medicine that they need throughout their lives, and we make sure we provide that for free when we place a dog. So they get all of their annual vaccinations, they're sterilized, uh, so there's no sexually transmitted diseases within that. And we provide livestock guarding dog clinics around the country as well. So far, we've sterilized, I think it's 440 uh, livestock guarding dogs around the country. Uh, at the moment, we're working with EcoShore, my other company from Australia, to see if we can roll out some dog clinics in the district uh, to vaccinate and sterilize dogs in the area because of that parvovirus threat that's currently a problem and impacting our livestock guarding dog program. Uh, but yeah, it's a big, it's a big job. Uh, but it gives people a lot of respect for these dogs. The Africanas are not super keen on the Swana dogs. They still prefer to use the Anatolians because they say they kill more jackals. 
<laughs> but we're still trying to convince them to use the little swana dogs. Just do it. They're so much better adapted to the environment and the climate. The, you know, the Kalahari is incredibly harsh. Anatolians don't seem to deal well with the real extreme heat in Botswana. So the swana dogs really yeah, are perfectly adapted after you know, some very severe um, selection pressure. Anyone can take one more? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, um, I was wondering, um, what's the cost of, um, for a family um, to have one of those dogs? Do you provide for free? And the um, feeding, is it something that you also provide or the family provides the food? Thank you. Yeah, great question. If I had more than 50, you gave me extra time, which was wonderful. But if I had more than 50, I would have said, yeah, no, the great thing about swana dogs is they're really cost effective. So they cost about a fifth of what an Anatolian shepherd would cost. Um, because they're so readily available in the community, you effectively don't even need to buy them. You can get one off your neighbor or whatnot. They can survive off very little proper dog food. They can survive very nicely off scraps, as long as it's a balanced diet. Um, and yeah, for place for us placing, we estimate it's around three hundred dollars. Uh, we provide three months worth of dog food just to get them started and get them strong, and then the farmer is required to cover the cost from there on in. But yeah, largely they usually give the dogs uh, leftover scraps, meat, rice from their meals that they have in the house, and and pallage pup um, maize meal uh, like polenta, uh, and that is sufficient diet for these dogs to, su to sustain themselves well and stay strong, you know. Brilliant. Thanks Thank very you. much, Jane. That was great. Thank you.